Hello there friends and welcome for today's Pathfinder guide we have at last all of the new 15 archetypes added by the latest Lord of Nothing DLC and some of them are quite powerful with many new unique abilities. While you do need the new DLC to get access to them they will still work for the main campaign of the game. And as we have a lot of ground to cover let's just dive right into it. First we have Alchemist and Reanimator. An archetype all around, summoning undead of course. Starting at level 5 you'll get simple reanimation which lets you cast Lesser Animate Dead, one of the new spells added by the latest patch. Most importantly, all the undead creatures you raise will get a very nice plus 4 alchemical bonus to both strength and charisma which does increase their hit points for the duration of the spell. Because it's alchemical, it's also going to stack with pretty much every other buff possible. And can help with the fact, by default, the undead summons are low duration, so you won't really have that much time to buff them properly, at least not so early. This will be upgraded to the Create Undead spell at level 11, with an extra plus 6 to Strength and Charisma as alchemical. Ultimately, at level 15, you'll get to cast the new Create Greater Undead spell for the strongest undead summons besides Lich, and all of your undead creatures will even get one additional attack per round. Quite a nice benefit, especially because, well, Create Greater Undead can reanimate Devourers, which have automatic level drain on hit, so the more attacks, the more level drain the enemy will suffer. You don't actually lose anything important with this archetype, I mean it's just less bomb damage, but if you've ever played Vivisectionist then you know alchemists are not all just about bombs. Especially because you still retain access to the mutagen as reanimator and most importantly as early as level 1 you'll have an ability that directly enhances both your attack and weapon damage rolls whenever you kill an enemy, also by alchemical bonuses. Second we have Barbarian and Flesh Eater, which as you might expect is all about devouring enemies. You'll get a Scaling Bite attack at level 1. Nice, because the more attacks you have the better. But the main unique feature of Flesh Eater comes at the second level. Power from Flesh, which essentially lets you devour an enemy corpse and you'll gain different bonuses depending on the type of the enemy you devoured. While it can be a Dragon, Fey, Magical Beast, Outsider or Undead, <laughs> Let's be blunt, it's going to be 95% of the time Outsider because of demons. Sometimes Undead maybe, but mostly Outsiders, if you were playing Kingmaker then sure you fight a lot of Fey and Magical Beasts, but not so much for Wrath. After you devour an enemy, you first gain a minor trait, depending on the type. For Outsider, for example, it's protection from alignment depending on their own alignment, right, so chaotic against demons, which increases every 6 levels you have. Not that strong of a benefit, I'm afraid, for the most common and most dangerous enemy type. At level 7 you'll also get the major trait, which for demons is spell resistance equal to 11 plus your level. It's okay, I guess, but you could just get the spell buff that does the same instead, so not really that important, as they won't stack. Lastly, at level 14, you get the corresponding special ability, which for demons I'm pretty sure is going to be Chaos Hammer. Not really that good of a spell, I'm afraid. Especially as it costs, well, essence points to activate. You start with just one, then two at level 7, and three maximum at level 14. Your essence points can also be used to heal yourself as a swift action. But of course, by devouring more enemies you also get more essence points. The main issue I have with this is that it highly cuts down your rage power progression, which to be fair is one of the strongest barbarian features, but I suppose you could always make up for that by just having a scald party member since they can well provide rage powers party-wide anyways. I just don't think it's going to be that good of an archetype when you have much more powerful stuff like Mad Dog or Instinctual Warrior. It's just that the benefits from Devouring Outsiders aren't that good. Next we have Blood Rager and Hag Riven, which is all about growing claws as weapons. You'll of course get more powerful claws as you level, 
with quite the nice benefit built in as early as level 1, strength damage every single time you hit the enemy with your claw attacks. Of course it has a fortitude saving throw, but since it's applied on hit, chances are it's gonna work eventually. Enemies can actually die from having their strength reduced to zero, but that's gonna take a while, I imagine. And then at level 5 you even get to enchant your claws with some nice effects. Kinda like Amagus. For example, Anarchy, Corrosive Burst, Flaming Burst, and so on. Or the Paladin Weapon Bond ability. You even gain a lot of bonuses to Natural Armor class starting from level 7. And the special critical feats added for free. It definitely feels more fun than the Barbarian Flesh Eater, even if I particularly don't care much about the Blood Rager class. We also have a new Cavalier archetype, Ghost Rider. This is quite fun. Well, I mean, I am biased towards pet classes, but as you are about to see, it is a nice enough archetype. The main unique ability is that you replace the normal horse patch you get at level 1 with a ghostly horse. Stats-wise, it's actually the same as a normal horse, but it does have a unique portrait and also a different model. Now, as far as I've tested, the horse isn't actually undead, despite being a ghostly horse, which, to be fair, is... A major benefit because healing undead allies early on was a major pain. At least you can avoid that. And later to let's say the Lich Mythic Path or even one of the animal companion archetypes, you can make your pet undead as early as level 1 if you want. I just rather not. Until the Lich buffs, anyways. Now, right at level 1, you also have another very powerful feature called Etheric Tether. As a free action, you can bond yourself with your horse. With this ability, whenever your horse's hit points would be reduced to zero or less, the rider instead will take damage and heal the horse back. This actually solves one of the main weaknesses of mounted combat, that is, while the mount will soak most attacks, ranged and physical, well, if it dies, the rider will fall flat on the ground and become vulnerable. With this, however, you can easily buy yourself time and heal your amount before it dies. After all, you're still a cavalier, you'll still have your very own defenses, so you can certainly take a few hits for your horse. Speaking about the horse, it also gets more powerful attacks, but you know, you can just buff it instead or equip it with gear, at least as far as overcoming damage reduction and magical enhancement value. It also becomes immune to difficult terrain eventually, and even against Concealment, but once again, you can just buff it for that instead. On the other hand, at level 11, it will increase in speed, which is nice because the horse is already very fast, and even become airborne at level 14, which makes it immune to ground effects and trip. Meanwhile, at level 14, you have the Spiritual Bond feature, which is kind of the same as Etheric Theater, but in reverse, right? So if the rider would be reduced to zero hit points, the horse will save you instead. And both can work together, so it makes you even tankier, both yourself and the horse. You even have another unique level 1 ability called Frightful Gaze as a standard action. Well, creatures around you must succeed at a will saving throw equal to 10 plus half your level and your charisma modifier, or become paralyzing fear for one round. Quite fun. As at level 9, it can even bypass immunity to mind affecting and fear effects while also making creatures immune to paralysis become staggered instead, also crippling. The only limitation is that, well, this has a few uses based on your Charisma modifier only per rest. And of course, as a standard action, it's going to prevent you from attacking in the same round. But at least early on, the effect can be quite good, because, well, it's paralyzation as an area of effect, even if it's just for one round. Definitely a solid class. Maybe not so much a powerhouse as Gendarme, but I enjoy the extra tanking capabilities this provides you. Now we have Cleric and the Separatist archetype, which I'm afraid is kind of weak, at least in my humble opinion, so the main unique feature is Forbidden Rights, which essentially lets you get first a normal domain according to your deity, but then also a second domain from, well, almost anything, right? Just like the Impossible Domain Mythic ability, that's the main issue I have with this, you can just get <laughs> impossible domain instead as a mythic ability for whatever domain you want, especially because 
the Forbidden Ones for the Separatist Cleric, well, they are scaled down. Which for domain powers is a bit annoying. You can always just go with, for example, the most min max daily choice, Erast you get two of the most powerful domains as early as level 1, and later just get the rest through impossible domain. Druids also have a new archetype, Winter Child. This has access to the new Ice subdomain, which provides you with a few ice spells for free. Creatures you summon will also get increased cold resistance, even the effect of the blink spell, which is very unique as far as summon creatures, and additional cold damage eventually. While it may seem at first like you lose the pet, you actually gain something more fun. Your very own Blizzard Elemental Companion, which works pretty much the same as an animal companion, it's a permanent ally that you can level up and so on, including choose feats. It also has a unique portrait, and as a matter of fact, it is the most unique pet of them all in that it is the only one that has ranged attacks by default. It constantly throws icicles at the enemy, and will also benefit from ranged feats such as Deadly Aim and Rapid Shot. Of course, the only downside is that you can't exactly tank with it unlike other pets, because, well, it's a ranged ally. Sadly, you cannot equip it with gear, which kinda reduces its power a bit when compared to the normal pets. And it will increase in power as you level up, eventually becoming quite decent. The only limitation I've seen so far, I imagine it's a bug or an oversight, but it doesn't seem like it gained more attacks from base attack bonus progression unlike other pets, which is a bit disappointing, as you'll be kinda stuck with one from haste, one normal, and one from rapid shot. Although you can grant it melee attacks with, for example, as called as always. And well, by virtue of being able to merge with the Angel Mythic path, Druids are always an amazing choice, especially as this lets you buff your Elemental Companion even further. Fighters sadly don't get anything new, but Hunters do. Tandem Executioner. Hunters are, of course, another pet class, always nice. And you do get a lot of unique abilities starting at level 4 that enhance both the character and their pet. You'll first get to select one out of four, and later you can upgrade it into two new abilities. But the second and third choices are reliant on the one you pick first. For example, we have Vigilant Partners as the first ability, which can later be upgraded into Timely Warning, and ultimately into Elusive Pair as the second and third abilities all have requirements based on the ones you pick first. But of course you can also combine them if you want. It's just that you only have six, so that's enough for two total lines. Now I'll cover each in depth in the main Tandem Executioner guide, but to put it simply, my favorite ones are the defensive lines, starting with Vigilant Partners, which lets you avoid hits for both your character and the mount, based on lore nature checks or mobility checks for the mount. Timely warning is the same, but for saving throws. And ultimately, Elusive Pair provides very rare dodge bonuses to AC for both the rider and the mount. But the offensive focus protective duo, which lets you retaliate with attacks of opportunity whenever the enemy attacks either the mount or the rider, is also very good because, well, Attacks of opportunity are busted good and there's plenty of support for maximum damage with them. You even gain the study target feature, usually limited to the Slayer class only, which of course means more damage and attack rolls and is also automatically applied to your animal companion. Just be careful because study target costs either a move action or later a swift action to activate. While you can automatically apply it when dealing sneak attack, the Hunter class does not get sneak attack progression at all, but you can always multi-class with one level into something else for that, like Rogue. The major limitation is that first, you lose access to all of the Hunter spell, which is kind of a big limitation, and you also don't get the Raised Animal Companion ability, which, well, doesn't really matter, you can always just rest to get your pet back. But it's definitely a fun new addition to the game. Next up we have Oracle and Dual Cursed Oracle, and let me tell you, this class is kind of OP. I mean, Oracles have always been amazing, and the Dual Cursed Oracle archetype actually enhances what's already best in Oracle. The Revelations, you get more of them. Not just that, but you also have access to two unique ones, one of which is extremely powerful. Misfortune, that can be selected as it is level 1, 
and Fortune starting from level 5. So Misfortune essentially makes it so that whenever an enemy within a huge area around you rolls a natural 20 on attack, saving throws, skill checks, they'll have to reroll the die. By itself, this is of course amazing because it's limited once per enemy, but you're always meeting new enemies and, well, preventing the enemy from rolling a 20 even once is already amazing, especially early on because, let's say on unfair, you don't want enemies hitting you because that's double damage, but it can also help, for example, prevent enemies from making saving throws as 20s are automatic successes for both attacks and saves. I'm actually surprised this is here because it's really, really good considering it's what a permanent effect, right? And like I said, you're always meeting new enemies to apply this on. Fortune, on the other hand, can be good, but it's a lot more limited because, well, it's the opposite of misfortune, so it actually hits your allies, but it is limited to just once per character per rest. And well, unlike enemies where you're constantly fighting new ones, you're stuck with the same allies per rest, right? So essentially, it's only once. I imagine it would be better to save this, for example, before a boss battle, because there's not much of a point in wasting it against trash mobs. Misfortune, on the other hand, is a powerhouse. Anyways, the Dual Cursed Oracle has even more benefits. You have three spells added for free. Ill Omen, Oracle's Burden, and Bestow Curse. Ill Omen being the best of them all, especially during later levels, as I've already covered in my new Mythic Abilities and Spells guide, as this is also available for the Witch class. To be fair, it does feel like Dual Cursed Oracle is essentially the best Oracle of them all now, because like I said, revelations are that good and you have even more. The main reason I wasn't a fan of the other Oracle archetypes is that they often reduce your revelation acquisition speed, something I don't want at all. Dual Cursed Oracle supercharges it instead. And the limitation of having dual curses, look, it doesn't mean anything because some curses have very minor effects like lame or plagued. Powerless Prophecy, however, can be quite crippling until you become immune to it through the Freedom of Movement spell. Anyways, it's a powerhouse, especially because, you know, you can become a merged angel with Oracle, a dual cursed one, of course. Paladins also have something unique, the Tortured Crusader, which is kind of like a selfish paladin, as you're about to see. While the normal paladin has many abilities that enhance allies as well, like the auras, the Tortured Crusader is all about enhancing your very own power. For starters, it's a paladin fully based on wisdom instead of charisma, and it's definitely one of the new archetypes with most new unique abilities. Essentially, you replace your normal smite evil for the always darkness ability. It kind of works the same. As a swift action, you can choose any target, doesn't matter the alignment. Angel gets you add half your wisdom bonus for paladins its full charisma to attack rolls and also your Paladin level to all damage rolls. This is the same for the normal Paladin as well. You'll also get a static bonus to Deflection, and later at level 11 this will upgrade into Final Justice, which is the same, but doubles the damage the enemy receives from you, so instead of, let's say, a plus 20, because it's based on your class level, you'll have a plus 40, quite a lot of damage per strike. You do get some of the Paladin auras, but they only work on yourself as I mentioned before. The same for the Lay on Hands ability, you can only heal yourself. Another fun fact about the Torture Crusader is that it actually has the highest amount of smites per rest of them all, because you can convert your Lay on Hand uses into more smites. You even get some bonuses if your own allies die, but that's a bit dangerous, I'd rather they remain alive. Anyways, you still have more benefits, you also get bonus combat feats at level 2, 8, 12 and 16, just like a fighter. So you're truly enhancing your power to the max. Now, as far as the downsides, well, unfortunately, you lose Mark of Justice, which, to be fair, is still the most OP paladin ability of them all, as it lets all of your party members benefit from your smite. And while you do have Final Justice, okay, it's plus 20 damage over that of a normal paladin, but would you rather have plus 20 damage on just a single character, or use Mark of Justice and have plus 20 damage added to the attacks, all attacks, even, of all party members, including summons, including pets. It's just way more efficient, I'm afraid. But Torture Crusader is unique enough in that it's certainly a worthwhile archetype. 
Next we have Rogue and Dark Lurker. I didn't really test it that much, but from what I've seen I found it pretty weak. First you get all of the blind fight feats for free. Okay, but there are spells that can kinda make up for that. You kinda have less rogue talents than the norm. Which is kinda sad because you can always use the talents to get more powerful feats. But anyways, your most unique ability is called Blade from the Shadows. Starting from the second level, you can as a standard action, well, kinda teleport behind a creature and make a single sneak attack against that target for free. While at level 14 this becomes way better because you can, as a full round action, unleash your full attacks with a melee weapon. This ability does have a limitation when it comes to users, so you can't spam it always, which is a bit disappointing, but it's just that for the earlier variant, it costs a standard action, right? So you're limited to just one attack. And rogues, well, the classic rogue always wants you to dual build, right? So you'll have more and more attacks as you level up. I just don't see much of a point. Especially since you don't have to be behind the enemies to sneak attack them in Wrath. The Shaman class also has a new archetype, Prophet of Pestilence, which is all about inflicting diseases on enemies. You have slower hex progression, but you'll get the unique Plague of Abaddon Hex. While it does have a saving throw, just like the normal Witch Hex, you can always spam it as many times as you want. So you can always hit more enemies with it. By virtue of being a disease, you can also bypass enemy immunities through the newly added Corruptor Mythic ability. And you can also trade hexes for mutations on your plague, which essentially increases the effect. Now, the plague itself might not seem like much at first, because it's just 1d4 ability damage, but you actually get to enhance it with a lot of other powerful features as you level up. And they all have previous requirements as well, for example for Drain Mind, you need to first buff the plague with one of the mental ability damage scores. I think my preferred pick is definitely the dexterity line, because by itself it can already reduce the enemy's AC and it gets even better later, to for example dulled reactions, which directly reduces the enemy's AC even further, and later stiffened limbs, which makes the enemy automatically flat-footed, thus denying their dexterity bonus to AC. Rather good for many of the powerful demons that have loads of dexterity. But of course you can even add more fun stuff like automatic level drain, higher ability damage, and even an nasty debuff that constantly forces the enemies to make saving throws or lose their actions by making them nauseated. You can also make an enemy sickened at level 1 as a touch attack, and even retaliate with your Plague of Abaddon Hex whenever enemies hit you starting from level 8, while level 16 provides you with Fatal Disease, so that, well, your diseases are even harder to resist. And you can even mass spread the plague all around as a level 20 capstone. Now at long last we have Shifter with a very fun new archetype, Word Touched, which of course is the Word Shifter, which gets access to the classic Word Animal forms. Word Rat, Word Tiger, and the most famous of them all, of course, the Werewolf. Now, Shifters have always been a very busted class. You can, for example, increase your stats to absolutely hilarious amounts. And the Word Shifter is as good as you might expect. First, you have a unique aspect, starting from level 1, just like any Shifter, Except this pretty much enhances all of your main physical scores by inherent bonuses, so it's always a good choice. It is only at level 4 that you can actually turn into the war forms. And each of them does something unique. They all have damage reduction that's penetrable by silver, but guess what? Enemies don't have silver weapons, so it's always gonna work. And they mostly have the same amount of attacks as well, true claw attacks and bite attacks. Now, the war rat, as far as unique features, can freely disarm the enemy whenever you bite them, which is quite good. Even if some enemies are immune to disarm, this also opens some cheesy interactions with Demon, an aspect of Kalavakus for looping attacks, as you might already know. Anyways, you'll also have sneak attack, as one might expect out of the War Rat, it's always been the classic rogue war form, but this has somewhat of low scaling, as you only get 2d6 at level 8, 
and then 3 to 6 at level 15 only. I'm not sure why they decided to limit it this way, perhaps because you can always change to the other forms, because, well, the Fae Form Shifter not only has 5 attacks at level 4, and full scaling sneak attack based on your full shifter level. You do have Weakening Wound for free, just like a Rogue, however, which can help a bit. And at level 15, Crippling Strike and Opportunist, amazing for extra attacks. So I guess in a way you do have something that Fae Form doesn't. But honestly, it's mostly about the free disarm, because you can, as a shifter, enhance your bite attacks so that you have way more of them per round, it's not going to be limited to just one. You'll have like five or so, not counting attacks of opportunity, of course. Anyways, War Tiger, on the other hand, is the best of them all for tanking. You start with the highest damage reduction of them all, five, which is quite respectable for level four, because like I said, enemies won't be able to bypass it. Well, at least not so early. And your most unique ability is higher AC equal to half your shifter level. You even get the combat expertise feat for free, of course, which also increases your AC even further. At level 8 you get 10 damage reduction, and even 15 at level 15, which is rather respectable. You also get the pounce ability, which is great because you can charge and full attack without having to rely on a scald and even 5 regeneration for free and the launch feat at level 15. Last but not least, we have the Werewolf. Its main unique abilities is being able to first make enemies bleed on claw attacks, which I wouldn't really bother with, because I'd rather just kill the enemies as fast as possible. Most importantly, just like the Were Rat, they have a free effect on their bites. Instead of Disarm, Werewolf has Knock Down, starting from level 8. And well, for the enemies that are immune to trip, you can always go were rat for free disarm. And yes, both loop just fine into infinite tasty cheesy stuff with the Kalavakus demon aspect. The werewolf even gets greater trip as a bonus feat, which is actually great because this lets you get attacks of opportunity when tripping the enemy, for even more attacks, of course. As I said, it's a very solid class. You can freely change between the forms you want for different bonuses. I think early on the Were Tiger is the best, but starting from level 8 is when I would consider Werewolf or the Were Rat. Mostly Werewolf for free trip. And honestly, all of them will still have amazing stats, including potentially very high AC, even if you don't go with Were Tiger. Overall, a super solid and very fun archetype. Nothing false calls, I'm afraid, but can I say they are OP enough <laughs> as it is? Sorcerers also have a very fun archetype. Geomancer, which is actually all cats homebrew, I think. It doesn't exist in tabletop. Thankfully, you get the most unique feature right at level 1. Geomancy. It works kind of like blood magic in a way in that first, you take damage when casting your next spell. 1d8 direct damage, that is. It might seem much early on, but I mean, starting from the second chapter, you have so many ways of healing your character that it won't matter anymore, especially because it will be absorbed first by temporary hit points. Anyways, in return for this, whenever you cast a spell, either all allies or all enemies will suffer a benefit or a downside. For allies it's always a benefit and for enemies it's always a penalty. And keeping with the Geomancy theme, this is going to depend on whatever terrain type you're currently standing on. Abyss, desert, forest, highlands, underground or urban, each has a different effect. But honestly, it's mostly all about abyss and urban, underground as well, there's not that many forests and highlands in the world wound, I'm afraid. Early on it's definitely urban for chapter 1, the toughest part of chapter 2, later abyss all the way. But anyways, I think the developers know this because, as you might expect, both Urban and Abyss have the strongest effects. For Urban, all enemies will take an extra 1d6 points of damage per level of the spell. By itself, this is already quite good, right? Because, well, you're essentially adding a fireball for free besides whatever damage your spell is already dealing, and since this will stack, depending on how many spell casts you have per turn, most casters can always get at least 2 spells going, so that's 2d6 extra damage per spell level. Demons even have 3 spells per round, so it adds up. But anyways, there's even more. For Urban, 
The enemies also have to make a fortitude saving throw or become stunned one of the strongest debuffs for one round. Abyss is kinda like the same, 1d6 damage per level and a fortitude saving throw or become corrupted which debuffs the enemy's stats. Underground is also extra damage while preventing enemies from moving, and as I mentioned before, this only hits enemies, right? All of the offensive ones. Highlands, on the other hand, is for party members, who will gain damage reduction, and forest healing instead. The good thing is that Geomancer doesn't really lose anything that important from Sorcerer. You still have your Bloodline, for example, which means it's probably going to be the best level 1 dip, for blaster casters who lost a lot of their more powerful tools in the latest patch. With Geomancer, however, you always have at the very least an extra 2d6 spell damage against all enemies per spell level. And yes, it will work with other classes spells, including fully scaling based on spell level. The only downside this class has is that... Well, besides level 1, it doesn't really grant you anything good. I mean, you lose the Bloodline feats and trade them for Favor Terrain, which is, well, very poor in comparison. It's mostly going to be a bonus to initiative, but it's not really that good. I'm actually surprised they didn't add an ability that lets you manipulate the terrain around you, right? Because that would be not only thematic for the class, but also very fun. Like I said, you don't really have many forests in the World Wound. That is the area the game takes place in. But it could be nice to be able to change terrain perhaps with a few uses per day, to actually get the effects you want instead of playing Terrain Lottery, if you know what I mean. But still, it's a very solid class and everyone that wants more spell damage will want at the very least one level into Geomancer. We are almost at the end and we have Witch and the Hag of... well, I don't know how to pronounce it, Girona, Girona, Girona... Anyways, it's the main Hag deity. Its most unique feature only comes at level 12, actually, which is, wait for it, a full-scaling hag companion, kinda like the druid elemental servant, except the hag will be automatically leveled, as she grows in power along with your character. She actually gets a lot of spells, most of them are rather poor, however, but there is an upside to this. The hag can cast all of her spells an infinite amount of times, which is very fun. Her stats are also very good, especially because you can buff her as a permanent companion. You can even gear her, except for her weapon, which will be stuck as a quarter staff. Amusingly enough, this evil granny can actually hit enemies just fine. Despite being limited to a quarter staff, like I said, you can buff her, and she has enormous base attack bonus progression, equal to a fighter even. So yeah, evil granny is really that good. I personally would rather have her attacking than casting spells, but she does have infinite haste and well, we all know how powerful that is. Anyways, you also have some other benefits at lower levels. You cannot select your pact, instead you have all of these spells here for free. Most are kind of poor, besides Cemento, I'm afraid. Then at the second level, you have an ability that increases the DC of your fear spells and a bonus to persuasion in return for a Hex. Later, at level 8, you have Sunder Hope, which is quite good. Whenever you successfully affect a creature with a mind-affecting spell, even a Hex, which is nice because most of the best Hexes are mind-affecting, you can automatically also hit the creature with a greater dispel magic, quite powerful. Except it has limited uses, right? You only have one at level 8, but more at level 14 and 20. Anyways, it's mostly about the Hag Companion herself, right? Because it is the most unique benefit of them all. While the earlier abilities aren't that good, I mean, as a witch, you can and want to just spam hexes anyways, and you still have access to them, including ones like Slumber and Evil Eye, which really help early on. Last but not least, we have Wizard and Shadowcaster. You lose the Arcane Bond feature or Familiar, and in return have access to, well, pretty much all of the illusion spells in the game, most of them anyways, including all of the Shadow Conjuration and Evocation line. While still retaining the ability to choose your specialist school, you are not limited to illusion, amusingly enough. Besides that, another unique feature is Summon Shadow, 
starting from level 7, you can actually summon a Shadow Companion. Unfortunately, while the Shadow itself is good enough because, well, first, it targets the enemy's touch AC with its own touch attacks, so it has an easy time hitting enemies and will drain a lot of strength, with more power as you level up. It's also somewhat hard to hit. But anyways, the downside is quite crippling, right? Because each round, including out of combat, the Shadow has to make a will saving throw or <laughs> turn against you. This is really limiting, because, well, first it prevents you from properly buffing the Shadow, despite the fact it has a very long duration. It's a ticking time bomb, right? Because all it takes is it rolling one once, and it will, eventually, it's a mathematical certainty. One is an automatic failure, doesn't matter how high you increase the saving throws. So, yeah, I mean, you kind of just want to dump it on top of the enemy <laughs> and pray for the best and hope he doesn't roll a 1 and become hostile against you. It's not that defeating it is hard, but... I don't know, I just don't see why it makes such an annoying limitation when other archetypes have, you know, permanent pets that don't suffer from this. I think it would be nice if Wizard had something unique as well. But we kind of missed the chance. Anyways, we still have a last unique benefit, Umbral Mind, which essentially is a profane bonus to your intelligence score scaling with levels. There's kinda of a limitation with this. First, well, earlier, you can use a special hat that already grants you a profane bonus to intelligence, and it won't stack. And later, you can just benefit from Nocticulous Gift, which is also profane and provides actually more than what you would get from Umbral Mine, plus 6. So I think it kinda gets outclassed. Meanwhile, your Capstone at level 20 lets you benefit from the Transformation spell without blocking spellcasting, which is rather good for fighter mages. And that's it for all of the new 15 Lord of Nothing DLC archetypes. As I said, we have some very nice choices here. If you found this guide useful, as always, please remember to like and subscribe, and also consider becoming a channel member if you can. I'd really appreciate your support. Thank you for watching and see you next time, friends, with, of course, the standalone guides for the new archetypes I find the best. Stay tuned for more.